Hello, everyone. I am so, so, so excited about today's speaker. Um, I know y'all are used to me saying that every single Tuesday, but that's really because if you've seen the lineup, it's like amazing. But thanks to the amazing friendship and this incredible profession, I have met some of the most amazing people. And because of that, it led me to Mr. Jarrett Gunderson. In fact, I joked recently, I was like, oh my gosh, it's like the six degrees of separation. Um, for those of you who are old like me, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon was like this big game in college. And it's like, I can't believe how this has, all these relationships that I've developed have led me to getting to meet Garrett after hearing about him for so many years. And on top of that, I have spent a lot of time reading his books, and I will tell you that it has absolutely changed my perspective on my finances, my family finances, and planning for the future and what we're going to do. In fact, Garrett, I just want to say thank you because it has truly impacted and changed my life and that of my kids, my foster kids, and, you know, future generations. So the first time I heard about Garrett a couple of years ago was from my good friend, Dr. Rhonda Sharman in Maryland, when she was telling me the story about how she went to lunch alone one day because she just needed a moment to breathe. And in the restaurant was fairly empty, and Garrett was eating lunch with my good friend, Dr. Fadman Mancini. And because there was no one in the restaurant, she could hear everything that they talked about throughout the entire lunch. And she was like, I, I feel like I'm kind of eavesdropping, I'm going to play on my phone. But something that they said got her attention. So for the rest of the lunch, she just politely just listened to what they were saying. And she posted on Facebook and said, I can tell you that their success is directly related to their positivity, willingness to take responsibility, and setting an intention and making it happen. It was the most unbelievable lunch. I was staring at my phone the whole time. But I was really thinking, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe that I'm a witness to this amazing wisdom. So, Garrett, thank you so much for being here today and sharing that wisdom with our audience today. You bet. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, thanks for your excitement and your kind comments as well. <clears throat> <laughs> You're so welcome. All right. So we'll dive in. There's going to be really a, a theme here, and it's going to begin with philosophically, the three ways that people deal with and look at money. And the very minority look at it the third way, yet it's the minority that holds most of the wealth, and the majority look at it these other two ways, and the majority is where we hear a lot of noise, but at the same time don't get real value. Then the second piece is, I want to show you how you can eliminate budgeting forevermore and keep a lot more of what you make and then automatically capture that without infringing upon your lifestyle. So... That'll be the focus. And then the third piece is really going to be just practical ways and dissecting a little bit further down exactly how you can keep more of what you make. And I'll pick up either looking at tax or looking at interest or, you know, investment fees or insurance costs. And just, you know, without having a coupon clip or scrimp or save, just put more money into your life. So beginning with the first piece, like no amount of luck or saving, no discipline, no rate of return, no financial advisor can save someone if they're stuck in the scarcity paradigm. Scarcity is the greatest destroyer of wealth. Scarcity is misleading because it has us believe that the world is in a place where it's a zero sum game. One person wins, the other person loses. One person's wealthy, someone else is have, has more you know, poverty. Like this is kind of that notion. And I believe that there's a fundamental paradigm called the producer paradigm, where people create more value in the world than they take from it where abundance, innovation, and value creation are the key, where scarcity wants you to believe that it's fear, doubt, and worry, that entitlement is the way, that do the least you can to just try to get by and skate by because the rules are so stacked against you, you'll never get ahead. That's the scarcity thinking. In scarcity, people think profit is evidence of deception or coercion or wrongdoing, but in abundance and in the producer paradigm, profit is evidence of value creation. It's it's really this world where if you're on the scarcity paradigm, you will limit your results, you'll lose your impact, and ultimately, if we apply that to money, money will, will continually be elusive, confusing, or something you never get to utilize or enjoy. Because if we go to the first side of the scarcity coin around money, that side is first and foremost, playing not to lose. By the way, um, playing not to lose is something I was really familiar with growing up. 
because I grew up in a small coal mining town, originally East Carbon, Utah, until third grade, then Price, Utah, the big city of 12,000 people, because my great-grandfather left San Giovanni in Fiore, which is a place in southern Italy, because he couldn't make ends meet. And he left his wife who was pregnant and didn't see his daughter until she was six or seven because he got on a ship, went over to Ellis Island, then got on trains and whatever way to finally get to this little tiny community to be a goat herder, live in a tent, and then eventually get hired by the coal mines and save enough, up enough money to get a home and get his family to come over from Italy. So that really created a scarcity mindset because not having enough money meant you could be separated from your family. And the only way to predict what's going to happen because mines could go on strike, there could be mine disasters, is that you better scrimp, save, sacrifice, and have grit because hard work is all that you knew and ultimately wealth was only for other people. And see, that mindset of playing not to lose is a budgeting mindset where it's about scrimping, saving, and sacrificing. It's about elimination. It's about the millionaire next door if you've read that book. The Millionaire Next Door says that if you never spend your money, you too can be a miserable millionaire. But the thing that book doesn't tell you is after you die, your heirs are likely to blow that money within 16 months because they were never talked to about it. They didn't understand the fundamentals of it. So all this sacrifice for what? Not for a better future or a better life. Seeing playing not to lose is a paradigm we see in sports when teams get ahead and then they stop playing their game and you see the other team start to come back and sometimes even win. Playing not to lose for me was when I was in high school, we had a basketball team that we were up at halftime 18 times, but only won three games because we were a different team in the second half because our mindset was different, which then meant our actions were different, our feelings and our emotions. Playing not to lose is so detrimental. It's so detrimental because how do you have quality of life when fear governs? How do you have quality of life and enjoyment when it's all about what you could reduce instead of what you could produce, right? So the game of wealth is you can't shrink your way to wealth. It's a game of value creation and expansion. It's a game of service and solving problems. And that playing not to lose doesn't have us think about anyone else but ourselves. And when we only think of ourselves in a survivalist scarcity mindset, it becomes a selfish existence. We're not filled up so much that we're overflowing with how that we can help people with their health or improve our communities or think about our impact. We're just trying to make it through. That's scarcity and it's so detrimental. And look, I could give you so many practical things that I will get there of what you could do in your financial life. But if I add more money to scarcity, there's just more to lose. There's just more concern. There's more confusion. So we have to really understand where in your life do you find a scarcity mindset where you think more about worry than value, where you lose sleep and you have unnecessary stress, where it's not about action, it's simply about blame, where it's about complaining rather than creating. If we're willing to assess that, because I'm not immune to this, like, man, I fall into scarcity. I'll be traveling like I hope everything's fine with my family. Like I get in scarcity about the loss of my family and it starts to occupy my mind. I'm not thinking productively. I'm just think, like in this insane place that I have no control over just because I'm traveling and away from them. Or there's moments where I get frustrated because of something happening and I, I, I tend to get into scarcity. The key is I'm aware of it now. And when you have awareness, you can escape that trap of scarcity. Too much of the population just thinks it's the way that reality is. It's the only possibility, and therefore they remain, they remain stuck in their results and limited in their enjoyment. So the flip side, flip side of scarcity coin, this might be where you it probably resonates with more people that are investing in something like this. And it's that playing to win mentality. The win at all costs. I'll work harder. I'll do more. And ultimately, the sacrifice of our own health, our own quality of life, our relationships, so many things because it's all about work more, work harder, do more. And hard work with the wrong philosophy still equals scarcity. Hard work with the wrong philosophy still equals bankruptcy. So let me pause here for a second and say, if it feels like I'm yelling, I get passionate about this stuff. It's just what I do. I'm weird that way. I'm not yelling, even though I'm loud. I mean, even when I whisper at restaurants, as we heard in the introduction, everybody can hear. Like, I just, my voice carries. So I'm bringing you a passion so that we can take a drab topic normally and bring some energy and breathe some life into it so you can pay attention to it. And I just acknowledge you for having the courage to face your finances. You've already chose abundance that way. But we want to avoid this playing not to lose and embrace this win then play is where I'm going. But the playing to win is this trap that people get stuck in. And I was there in my 20s. I was playing to win. 
I even told my dad, dad, I'm going to work harder than anyone else is willing to work because in the future, I'll be able to live a life that no one else will be willing to have. And he said, son, I appreciate that work ethic. I mean, he's a coal miner. He knows work ethic. He said, but you'll never be able to get back the experiences that you never have. The experiences that you never have. See, like we have life pass us by if it's just harder and more. And, and I got to I got to achieve that at all costs. So that's the question I want to ask. Playing to win at what cost? Is the juice worth the squeeze? And is it a game worth winning? Like I've had this realization recently that I have a bit of perfectionism in me. And the problem with perfectionism is an unwinnable game because nothing's ever perfect and there's always more to accomplish and do. But if we get caught up in the doing and never having the being and the excitement along the way or the appreciation or celebration, well, that's when other things start to be diminished. So I believe that there's a difference between being wealthy and being rich. Being rich means you have a lot of money. And my son just the other day said, hey, dad, are we rich? And I said, I am. I have no idea about you, son. That's yet to be determined. He's 11. Uh, he's not entitled to a single dollar of earnings that I've made. I don't want to spoil or ruin him, but he could tap into that if he chooses a life of purpose, if he chooses a life of value creation. But being wealthy is different. Being wealthy comes in five tracks. The first one being, yes, money, that's part of it. Anyone that says money is not important has one of two things going on. One, they're embarrassed about their situation and think they should be further along, so it becomes an excuse. Or two, they have so much that they don't have to worry about it anymore. But the reality is what we say is not important is typically elusive to us. Money is critically important because it's lifestyle. It's part of how we exchange with one another. But there's four other things that bring wealth into our life. The second one is purpose. Purpose is our sole purpose, our values, our abilities, our passions combined for the highest context of our life. It's really who we are when we're at our best. And purpose is one of the most powerful forces in money, that's for sure, but also in quality of life. Now, the third piece is mindset. And that's where we began right now. We talked about the playing not to lose. Right now, we're talking about playing to win, which are two sides of a scarcity coin that destroy wealth. Well, if they don't destroy wealth, they destroy health or they destroy experience, or they destroy quality of life on the playing to win side, because yes, you can have a lot of money, but you might have to spend that just to try to get your health back. So when I look at the mindset as the third piece, we've got the first track being money, the second one being purpose, the third one being mindset. If you had all the money in the world, but you're deeply in scarcity, you'll just be worried about losing it. The fourth thing you guys know well, it's health. You, you know, there's a proverb that says, Someone with their uh, someone without their health or someone with their health has thousands of dreams. Someone without has but one. See, there's there's someone in the Forbes 400 that actually is diabetic, lost his legs. Pretty sure he'd give all of his fortune back just to have those legs back. But you can't always get your health back because sometimes you took you neglect it for far too long and it becomes an issue. So so health is a part of it. And then the last piece is really the three R's: relaxation, recreation, and rejuvenation. I call that social. So money, purpose, mindset, health, and social well-being. It's those experiences. To be truly wealthy, you have depth or you have quality in that. Not perfect balance, but you're just intentional about that. And really win for you or success begins with what you want it to be. Not society saying being on the cover of a magazine and then having more money than anyone you know and working harder and being like all this kind of stuff. A lot of people check those lists and they don't have this place where they feel fulfilled and excited and a lot of wealth. So the key is how do you create a, a depth in harmony in those five key areas? Because when you do, you end up treating yourself as the greatest asset. You have more to give to the world because you manage your energy and you're living a life worth living because it's a life that you love. So scarcity will destroy that because it's the wrong rules. It's a, a veil that doesn't let us see the true nature of value creation and service and solving problems. But this third mindset comes from abundance. This third mindset comes from, you know, value creation and producer paradigm. And it's to win first, then play. What do I mean by that? When you make money on the buy when you invest, then you've already won before waiting for it to speculate or if you keep more of what you make because you pay less in tax legally and ethically, you save on interest by having the right credit scores and structures, or you save on investments by detecting the hidden fees and commissions and non-performing pieces of that, or insurance, you avoid duplicate coverages or costs. You've already won because you're keeping more money. You didn't have to go work harder to earn more. That's a win. Or there's something that we use called the cycle of creation, where you could take an idea and with that idea become extraordinarily profitable before spending a single dollar on it. We're in the middle of doing this with my book called 
women in play, we're creating a pre-sell where people get four webinars, four transcripts before the book ever comes out. They get to be part of an advanced reader group and get the book before anyone else, get access to the audio book before the print version even comes out because they invest now and we've already made money from the book before it's even released. That's the cycle of creation where we can profit from our ideas without spending a single cent, right? These are just a few women play ideas. We can look at the bigger picture of women play. The NFL made money before the game was ever played with the Super Bowl. They sold the TV rights. They had an NFL experience that leads up. That There's concerts and all these things that they've sold out. There's all these things that are happening before we even know if the game's good or not. That's when they play. The Statue of Liberty, when France gifted to the United States, didn't come with a visitor center or concrete things for, to wreck that up and hold it up. So they just raised money for the first visitors to be able to pay before it was even open. And that was less than a dollar for almost everyone back when that happened. And then they got their name on blocks and then they showed up and they were the first ones to experience the Statue of Liberty. It wasn't raising funds from investors. It was actually using a wind and play strategy. So that mindset says, how do you create a win-win exchange? How can you be more profitable because you've served others, you've solved problems? And ultimately, how do you make sure that you're living the life that you want to lead, the life that you want to live? The life that makes you happy because you've defined it and you're in the driver's seat to build that life that you love because you don't get a second chance to create a legacy that lasts. But legacy is something that you live. So one thing I know is I know how to talk fast, but I want to set up the stage philosophically so that now when we understand win and play, I'm not asking you to separate from your money. I'm not asking you to wait for 30 years so that one day, someday you can enjoy retirement if you just fund these assets and retirement plans. I'm looking to add money to your life now to find that cash through financial savvy and insight and improve the bottom line. No more eliminating expenses and cutting out and not appreciating quality of life along the way. This is truly about living a better life where you win now because it's the definition of what a win means to you. And that's one question I just want to ask. Is the juice worth the squeeze? And how do you make sure that you enjoy the journey? When everything's about getting to a destination of one day, someday, there's no win in that. That's playing to win. You hope to get there, but you get there and you might not be fulfilled. Win and play is what are the types of things that you could define right now that is a life that you want to live? Like I'm going to be filming today. I'm going to be doing another webinar. I've already done a podcast and a Facebook Live. And I also met with someone that's going to have me on their, on their podcast. Like that's a win because I'm engaged in my sole purpose. I am a thought leader in the financial space to help liberate 1 million people so they become financially independent. And financial independence is where you have enough cash flow coming in from assets and your business, even if you don't show up that day, to cover basic expenses. That's economic independence. 95% of people, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, are not there at age 65. 95% failure rate. I've got to flip that and completely turn it around because that's unacceptable that people are giving up their dreams, living for one day, someday and missing out on experiences along the way. So yes, I know how to deal with the dollars and cents and the nitty gritty and the nuts and bolts, but that's the easy part. The harder part is for you to get crystal clear on what you want out of life, what your sole purpose is so that you can create a great environment that you get to enjoy money instead of money becoming a detriment or an obstacle or something confusing, that you get to set up a win on how you live your day, day by day. Like I start my day with a bit of a ritual. So this morning, you know, I played a little bit of guitar, which was kind of meditative for me. A lot of times I actually meditate. I did a nice workout. I wrote in my five minute journal, some gratitude. Like I've won before the day even began. Stephen Covey in the late 1970s wrote that if you take the first half hour of the day and you invest it in yourself, You'll transcend what the other 23 and a half hours are like because you can get done more with less, right? So it's simply investing in yourself, right? It doesn't even take money to do that. It just takes creating conditions to live an extraordinary life. So what are those conditions for you? What is your win? Is the juice worth the squeeze? Where can you go back and assess and say, where am I playing not to lose? Or where am I merely playing to win? And how can you win before you even begin? That's where we're getting. So let's make those wins just in today's short time and ways to put more money into your pocket so you can invest in people to support the right conditions for you. You can invest back to grow more economic independence, pay off loans, or just improve your quality of life. But ultimately, let's find money for you to have permission to invest back in yourself in some way, shape, or form. So there's four main eyes that help you to achieve like keeping more of what you make 
and become the first of five ways to become economically independent. So this has nothing to do with budgeting. It simply has to do with efficiency. See, there's three ways you can live within your means. The first way is to budget. Let's face it, budgeting sucks. It's no fun to cut back and eliminate, not, not enjoy life. But the second thing we could do is just be more efficient with the money we do make. That's the four I's, IRS, interest, investments, and insurance. Those are the four key areas, right? And then the third way to live within your means is to continually seek to expand your means. How do we expand our means? Add more value, reach more people, more deeply impact those we currently serve. Like there's ways that we add more value and that's the way to unlock wealth is to become a value creator at the greatest way that you can, which is your sole purpose. So three ways to live within your means, budget, be efficient or expand. We're gonna to focus today on efficiency. We began with mindset because we have to have the right foundation. You are your greatest asset, not a stock, a bond, a piece of real estate, or even your business, it's you. So how can you invest better in yourself to create more conditions for success in a way that is congruent with what you define success to be, so it's not all about sacrifice, it's about enriching your life along the way. Let's start with the I for the IRS. The IRS, which you can go to wealthfactory.com forward slash tax to get some really cool deduction um, ideas, and I've written some cool articles about having the right tax team, but let me give you a framework. Like if you wanna save on tax, there's three ways to really do it. Number one, you gotta build the right team and how you operate with them. Number two, the right way to maximize your deductions. And number three, something called reclassification. Reclassification is the game changer that most people miss. And the reason why it's in 2011, our study showed 93% of doctors were overpaying on their taxes. And now I believe it's closer to 98% or greater because of all the Trump tax plan changes that people have a hard time navigating. So I'm kind of giving you a nice navigational map to simplify it and improve your life today. So with the team, the first part, I want you to meet with them every quarter. Because even if you have the most amazing tax professionals, they're not always great at coming up with great ideas because they're navigating within the confines of the law. So that's great that they do, but you can brainstorm with them. So the three people on your team is just whoever keeps your books. It could be a, a bookkeeper, a controller, or a CFO. The second one is a tax strategist that helps you maximize your deductions. And the third one is an attorney that helps you to choose the right corporations to reclassify your income. So meet with them every quarter and brainstorm with them. Then every three years, look back with a new set of eyes to see if you missed anything, because you can go back and amend your returns if you miss certain deductions or opportunities. The second part is those deductions. And what you mainly have to ask yourself is, number one, how does it relate to your business when you spend money? If it does, number two is document it. When you document it, then when you meet with the team every three months, you ask them if you can write it off or not. If they say, I don't know, or I don't think so, say, in what cases could I write it off? What would it take to be able to write that off? But capture it so you can have a conversation around it. Easy deductions. You can pay your kids up to $12,000 if you, if you live in the U.S. That's tax deductible to you. And if they're under 18, that could be completely tax free to them. Um, there's something called the Augusta rule where you could rent out your home, whether it's to have employees, uh, vendors, or even patients over and host something. And you can write that off for renting it out, you know, um, for the business, but you don't have to claim it as personal income if it's under 14 days. That's called the August rule. That's just two of hundreds of tax deductions, wealthfactory.com forward slash tax to get really good resources to dive in on the deduction side. But let's go to the third category. The first one was the team. The second one was the deductions. The third category is reclassification. This is where almost everyone I've ever talked to is missing opportunity to save on tax legally and ethically. The way to do it is first is how do we move your active income to become more passive for tax purpose? You'll save somewhere between 3.2% and as high as 15.3% to go from active to passive income, even if it's the same dollars, just how it comes to you. The second is how do you take ordinary income and make it become capital gains, which can lower your taxes, or even learn about something called the 199A. And there are exclusions as a doctor to this, but there's a way to get past your deductions when you're not you know, with patients. So that might be other parts of your business um, or things you have to reclassify to get it. The third one is how do you have tax-free opportunities as a business owner? That could be things like a charitable trust. There's, there's a few things like an employee stock option plan. There's ways that you can you know, use your business to get tax-free like exit strategies. And the fourth one is called tax arbitrage, which just means how do you spend a dollar and get more than a dollar back from the government rather than what most people do? 
is they spend a dollar to get 37 cents back. So reclassification, it comes into the type of corporations you choose. Is it an LLC, S Corp, or C Corp? That's a big piece of it. How you take your income, that's a big piece of it as well. And look, we have a short period of time, but I want to give you the framework and just give you some concepts of how to save tax. And like I've given you resources to dive in a little bit further, but we've got to get to some of these other areas. So build the tax team. Every three months, meet with them. Every three years, do a look back. Make sure to maximize your deductions. I give you two really clear-cut strategies on that. And three, reclassify your income. Learn how to move active income to passive. That's how you take your income from your corporation, which, yes, you should be incorporated. Ordinary income to capital gains. There's things like something called a captive insurance agency for people that are really doing well that might be able to do that. Or if you sell internationally, international sales corp would be two examples. Or tax-free, which a charitable trust is probably the coolest strategy that you could learn about in that. And look, I'll just I'll be happy, you know, uh, Christy, to give people a, a free copy of what would the Rockefellers do because I talk about how to do that in that book so that you have those resources. And then the fourth one is tax arbitrage. Like I bought artwork. And after owning it for three years, I donated it and I got $2 back for every dollar I spent because of how well I bought the artwork. Or there's something called conservation easements. Like I'm just giving you things to look up and understand. But ultimately, I just want you to know the framework and planting seeds so you know how to have better conversations and give you tools like wealthfactory.com forward slash tax to help improve your life so you even know what these advantages are. So there's four ways to live within your, you know, there's three ways to live within your means, budget, be more efficient or expand your means. We're focused on efficiency. There's four main eyes to efficiency, the IRS, interest, investments, and insurance. And we focused on just some basic framework on the IRS side. I'll be putting out YouTube videos um, coming up on exactly how to do this and having a lot more depth around it. But let's move into interest. See, if someone has more than one loan, there's like an 80% chance they're paying too much in interest. So there's three R's we're going to focus on in this. How can you reallocate, which is take underperforming assets and pay off higher interest rate loans. Number two, how do you renegotiate? How do you get higher interest rate loans negotiated down to lower interest rate loans and restructure, which is how do you refinance loans so that for the same dollars you're paying, you get to pay things off faster or you're required to pay less. And I remember speaking at a chiropractic event where it was in Minneapolis. I remember it because I left Cancun at 82 degrees, landed in Minneapolis at negative 22 those people in Minneapolis are tough people, right? Negative 22. And what happened was when I was talking, someone kept raising their hand. And I was like, hey, I'm not even starting yet. Should I go out in the freezing cold because this feels weird? And they said, look, my husband's a doctor. I'm a CPA. We started working with you guys 13 months ago. You said we could shave off a third of the time of our nine-year, nine-month, nine-second plan uh, to pay off our loans. And that's not what's going to happen. And I was like, oh, this kind of sucks. She goes, we're actually 17 and a half months out from being completely out of our debt and having no loans because they use these three R's I'm talking about. So this is also a part of the bigger process called cash flow optimization, which for every quarter of a million dollars that a doctor earns, we find around, no, sorry, for a half a million dollars of earnings, it's $2,484 per month. Above a half a million to a million, it's 4,117. But ultimately, there's a lot of money there that's going to in institutions and being inefficient. So let's break this down into a couple categories. Reallocation. If you have a certificate of deposit like my buddy Mike had, that was only earning 3%, but he had a business loan at 6%. I was like, hey, why don't you cash out the certificate of deposit or CD and pay off the business loan? He's like, well, there's a penalty. Well, we got to hold the institution on a chat. It's forfeiting three months interest. So if you think about that, after a month and a half, he was now going to be ahead forevermore, and it's a huge return because imagine if you bought a supplement for three bucks and you sold it for six. That's a 100% markup. So you're getting a 100% better situation if you have a 3% interest rate that you're earning and you pay off a 6% interest rate that you're paying, and it's a guaranteed improvement. So if you have cash values, you might be able to pay off loans, retirement plan loans that you could pay off with better interest rates than maybe your current loan, or you could go get a car loan and pay off a higher interest rate credit card loan. There's all ways to kind of look at this and reallocate. Now let's talk about renegotiate because there's four C's that can really help you renegotiate. The first one is a good credit score. You gotta know how to get your credit score above 780, right? If you get your credit score above 780, you could get better interest rates. Number two is the right collateral can help you to renegotiate. 
a car loan is going to have a lower interest rate than a credit card, like I just mentioned. The third one is you've got to have the right cash flow reporting. So credit score, you've got to have collateral, and then cash flow reporting so that the bank knows that you're a good borrower. A lot of people don't have good cash flow reporting, so the banks aren't really willing to lend them at the best rates. And the fourth one is the right connections. Dr. Kara up in the Pacific Northwest, she was going to get a loan at 6.5% on a commercial building. But with the right four C's, we got it at 4.18%. That's a major savings, almost a third less interest that she'll pay over that lifetime because of the four C's. So you can renegotiate. Like a credit card is the easiest one. You can call and say you're looking to do a balance transfer or cancel or get to the deals department because you have other opportunities to maybe get a better interest rate. And the first thing they're typically going to do is move you to the retention department and they'll lower your interest rate before about anything else. So credit cards are really easy. A mortgage might be a little bit more difficult, but if you could do a streamline where you stay with the same lender because you've got equity, you've paid on time, you don't have full refinance, but they lower your interest rate because they know you have better options with maybe a drive-by appraisal, which is 200 bucks versus a full appraisal at 650 with three pages to close with documents rather than 300 or 30 or whatever it is. And so a streamlined refinance could be super useful. Doctor, uh, This Dr. Jason who's up in the Tahoe area, saved 750 bucks per month doing a streamline. And he didn't even think it was going to be worth making the call. It's worth it if you know how to renegotiate, which is some of the things I'm planting the seed for today. And then the fi final one is to restructure. So that's where you could maybe refinance things into your home so you get a lower interest rate. So you get it tax deductible versus non-tax deductible, where you can lengthen the loan so that you have a lower payment and you can save up more money so that when that money saved up, you could pay off a loan in one fell swoop or build up the savings account and liquidity to give you more staying power. So I, I know I get going. I know there's a lot to this, but, you know, there's plenty of resources I'll make sure to give you. Like if you want to get a copy of what the Rockefellers do and read this at your pace versus my, you know, pretty phonetic pace, um, you can just text 801-503-9667. Put in the text in the subject line WWRD and is, as in what would the Rockefellers do? So. 801-503-9667 WWRD. That's going to give you a download of the book immediately. And if you want the physical copy of it, you pay shipping, I'll pay for the, I'll invest in you and pay for the cost of the book. So that's, you know, something we can do to give you a little bit more since you're Christy's out there reading the books and having this improve her life. I want to make sure to give you those resources. So we began with mindset. The mindset of playing not to lose or playing to win are two sides of a scarcity coin. One where it's all about being afraid of what we could lose and, and just scrimping. The other one where we could just work so hard that we miss out on life's and life experiences and burn ourselves out. We're now talking about win then play. How do you win before you begin? We're talking about how to keep a lot more of what you make because there's three ways to live within your means. The first one being to budget, which sucks. You got to do that if you're a train wreck, but if not, I'll show you what to do otherwise. Or be more efficient where we're focusing and emphasizing today or expand. So the first thing we talked about was the IRS. You want to have the right team. You know, that's getting the right bookkeeper, having the right uh, tax strategist and the right attorney. So you choose the right corporations, maximize your deductions, which is the second piece. And the third piece is that reclassification so you can get less tax on the income that you make. So then we went into interest and we talked about the three R's. What can you do to renegotiate interest rates? What can you do to restructure your loans? And and ultimately what you need to reallocate assets that are underperforming to pay off higher interest rate loans that are going to free up cash flow and improve your finances in a guaranteed way. Now on the investment side, the third I, I just want you to make sure that you have downside protection. See, because they're going to report losses when a recession hits, but it's not losses. It's transfer of money to other people. So if you put a trailing stop loss, that says if the market goes down by a certain percentage that starts to have you worry or create scarcity and automatically move to cash, you don't have to participate in the whole downside. Or if you figure out what kind of fees you have, 12B1 fees, which are marketing fees, expense ratios, which might pay the fund managers, you got to make sure that they're outperforming other pieces, otherwise it's non-performing, or admin fees or legal fees. If you can learn where those fees are and recapture them, those could be six or seven figures over your lifetime back into your pocket. We've seen that 2.5% is what most people are paying through all the fees of their retirement plan. That's massive. Imagine if you just had a lower cost one and you got it for less than a percent. That's a huge difference. You know, the difference between earning 9.2% and 10% over 30 years off 100 grand is over $300,000.
it seems like, oh, it's less than 1%, but it's exponential. It's compounding. So I want you to pay attention to dollars and cents. I want you to protect the downside. So now we've talked IRS. We've talked interest. We've talked, um, insur or we've talked sorry, investments. And now everybody's favorite topic, insurance. Now, I'm joking, obviously, on that. But here's the simple thing. Stop insuring inconsequential things. Raise deductibles, you know, increase elimination periods. Don't have things that you can write a check for if the incident happens today be something insured by an insurance company. Just take care of those yourself. And everything that would be catastrophic or damaging or hard to overcome, transfer that risk to the insurance company. So insure the catastrophic, not the inconsequential, and you're going to save a boatload of money. I had some friends in Chicago. They had really low deductibles. They had really high limits of liability and no umbrella policy. So all we did was raise their deductibles to $1,000 or $2,500, depending on if it was car or homeowner's insurance. Then we lowered their limits to the minimum required on their car and home for an umbrella policy. And then the umbrella policy sat on their multiple homes and their car and covered all of them. And what they ended up doing was spending $240 less per year with $9 million more in coverage. These guys are worth quite a bit of money. That was huge because they stopped insuring the inconsequential. We removed duplicate coverages and we did the proper structure. I didn't even have them change companies. It's not about whether you're with the caveman or the Geico lizard or the famous football player or the coneheads. I mean, these are creative, really good commercials, but I'm worried about you keeping more of what you make without infringing upon creating more risk or without losing the transfer of that risk. So we've really covered four main eyes, IRS, interest, investments, and insurance, just some basics, just some tastes. I've offered up my book so that you can download that and you can dive in deeper. I've given you wealthfactory.com forward slash tax. I've given you some resources through this as I go through this education. A, I know I talk loud and fast. The good news is this is being recorded. You could play it back in half speed. I'm listening to Killing Sacred Cows right now as I create some content and just reviewing it. And I'm like, damn, I, I'm sitting there going like, if I'm gonna critique this guy, he's talking too fast. But if I went too slow, it would bore the hell out of everybody. So I'm looking for that happy medium. That's why I keep going back and recapping to make sure, is this simple? Can you understand it? Does it make sense? And when I get into some of the nitty gritty and the opportunities, it's just to plant the seed. It's just to be like, ooh, that's something to research more and learn about, right? And then you could check us out and see what we could do to kind of support you. So, so anyway, those are a couple suggestions there. Now, if you want one-on-one -on -one support, you can text the number 310-621-2980, because as Christy mentioned, Derek, who I work with, will absolutely get on the phone with you and talk strategy and help you make sense of all this. 310-621-2980, Derek. And so I've worked with Derek for, I don't know, he started mentoring me when I was a teenager at a program called Governor's Honors Academy. It's for the top 50 students in the state of Utah. Um, fortunately, one of them dropped out and I was number 51. So hell, I got to go. I got to meet senators. I got to meet uh, Ren Zafiropoulos, who created Xerox. I got to meet, you know, scientists. I got like this amazing 10 days. And he was a counselor for that. So we became really good friends, such good friends that in full disclosure, I married his sister. Yeah. My son said that was pretty messed up when uh, we were joking about that the other day. He's like, dude, you married your friend's sister? I'm like, that's your mom you're talking about. But anyway, um, Derek is absolutely so committed to this profession and happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one because I'm giving you frameworks and ideas and you may say, how does this apply to me? What can I do to improve my financial life? How can I avoid budgeting and start to create an automated wealth structure system? And that's what I'm going to complete and conclude today with. Instead of budgeting, what if you just set up a separate account at your bank? And every time you pay yourself a paycheck, take a percentage off the top and send it over to that wealth capture account. Build up plenty of cash in that account. Get at least three months, even preferably six months of your personal expenses set aside. You automatically save that money. And when it gets above that, you can choose to deliberately invest. Not automatically invest, automatically save and deliberately invest. People that automatically invest have far too many fees and losses and, and it's just a terrible situation. But if you automatically save and then when the right investments come, it might be paying off a loan, might be investing in your business. It might be the right you know, real estate thing because that's your passion. I don't know. We all have our own investor DNA. So risk is in you, the investor, not the investment that you make. So make sure you become a better investor and only invest in what you know. If you don't know, Derek can teach you cash flow banking, which is a structure to store your money at four or 5% tax free or tax advantaged 
have downside protection that when the market goes down, your money doesn't go down and you can have access to it before 59 and a half. Pretty phenomenal strategy. Look, we've covered a lot today in this 40 minutes that we've been together. We've covered everything from the mindsets, which if you can master the mindset and you can really start to grasp when you're in scarcity, become aware of it and remove yourself from the situation by serving others, by talking to peers or mentors and by asking better questions and then getting past that sooner, you're going to have more wealth. If you can learn to win, then play. That's keeping more of what you make. So that when you automatically save, it's not through budgeting. It's through the efficiency of paying less to the government, less to institutions, and less to insurance companies because now you're in the know. It's not about scrimping and saving. It's about simply being efficient. And when you take that efficiency and that extra money, think about investing in yourself first, foremost, and always. What is the greatest skill set you can develop? What are the best people you could hire on your team so you can produce more with less stress for you? What are the right processes and systems that I had to be more productive and get less into the minutia so you can enjoy life along the way? And I'm here to say, you know, BJ Palmer said, the bigger your vision, the more oftener you should travel, the more you should take time off. Why? So you can rejuvenate and you come back the best version of who you are. So this has been fast. It's been furious, but hopefully it's been extraordinarily valuable. This is about bringing simplicity to your life, improving your financial life, and extending resources so you can see this as implementation, not just information. My intention is to inspire you and to give you a lot to think about and then give you the resources to take that thinking and actually see that come into fruition into your daily life of money. Thank you so much, Garrett. Um, I just want to say, take him up on this offer because this book, What Would the Rockefellers Do? I read it in a day. Then I sat on it, thought about it for a couple of days, called Derek, asked him 101 questions, went back, and I read it again. And read Killing Sacred Child. Unbelievably well written. And it really opened my mind to so much stuff. It really helped. Then I had to get it on audio so that my husband could hear because he doesn't want to sit down and read a book. And he, quite frankly, loves the speed in which you talk. <laughs> That's good. Um, good. And, and We've been doing this webinar series for eight years, and this is probably the first webinar that we've ever done that I'm not the only one who's sitting here watching this. My husband is sitting here. My 11-year-old son or 12-year-old son is sitting here, and we're watching this because that's how important this is. You know, at Car Health, we care so much about your personal and professional success, which is why I am ever so grateful for all the people who work so hard to help connect me with Garrett to bring this webinar to you. And normally these webinars are available for only one year, but this webinar will live on our website forever. And I want you to go back and I want you to listen to it again because sometimes when you hear it the first time, you pick up a couple nuggets of truth. When you listen to it the second time, you pick up a couple more nuggets of truth. Take up the offer, reach out to Derek, go to wealthfactory.com, unbelievable website. Um, Seriously, I've probably like shown up in their feeds like a million times because I've been just immersed in this for the last couple of months since I had the opportunity to meet Garrett in November. Sadly, how I met him was because I almost busted face first down an escalator, which I was running up. <laughs> Quite embarrassing. Um, but hey, it made it a lot easier when the amazing mentors in my life all took the time to introduce me to him multiple times in a two-day weekend. <laughs> so, um, Garrett, thank you so much because this thank has you. been six months in the making. Awesome. Um, just in conversations with you. It's been on my wish list, my bucket list for a year. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening. I'm going to give a huge shout-out to some amazing people who helped to make this happen. Um, Dr. Fabio Mussini, Dr. Jay Greenstein, the amazing Joey Coleman, um, Miles Bogdan, Holly, um, Kathy Mills Chang, um, even Sean Wayland, who is my husband's like favorite person to listen to on podcast, talked about killing sacred cows um, one day, and so it, it was so interesting. Is that we're sitting here talking about my husband's like, oh, I know who Garrett Henderson is. And I'm like, what? And how all this stuff came together, and of course, to Dr. Ray Foxworth, my amazing mentor and boss, because this is the most incredible webinar we've done so far, and I'm so excited to see all of the amazing things that we continue to do in the future. Um, and in fact, Derek is going to be a guest of ours in the next month as well. So again, 
take the time. We're going to end this a few minutes early because I want you to stop what you're doing before you see patients. Request the book. Then you can send me an email and thank me because I'm insisting that you get the book and read it. Number two, go to wealthfactory.com. Check out everything he gives you. It's unbelievable. And then reach out to Barrett because it will change your life. I promise you it will change your life. So thank you, everyone, for being on the webinar today. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day and an awesome week, and we'll see you next week.